Hey, it's Chris Chico, and I have another case study interview here with Facebook ads for motivated sellers. I have here Jamel Gibbs, and uh, him and I have known each other for quite some time. Uh, and uh, recently, last year, he reached out to me. Um, and I'm not sure how you, why, uh, maybe you saw it on YouTube or something, but you reached out to me asking me about Facebook ads. And I said, yeah, um, do, we were doing Facebook ads, we're having tremendous results. And then I shared with him kind of what we were doing. And then uh, we went back and forth. I gave him access to my materials and he's implemented, uh, implemented uh, Facebook ads. And so he's having great success with it. And um, what I want to do is, you know, him and I have a, just a conversation about what he's doing. Uh, he's doing something I'm, I'm not doing, which I should be doing, which is how do you structure deals creatively? Because I think a lot of times, you know, we get a lot of leads, you know, whatever channel you're using, whether it be Facebook or anything else, and you get a lot of leads and you might say, well, gee, you know, these leads are not great. I'm not able to do, put a deal together. But sometimes thinking a little bit creatively out of the box enables you to take and make money from leads that perhaps you're throwing away. And that's what I wanted to uh, also chat uh, with Jamel about. So I appreciate you coming on. So thank you for that. Yeah, man. And uh, I, I, kidded, uh, I kidded with him. And I said, you know, the only thing is, is that uh, um, I always feel like, uh, what's that, Clark Kent, uh, next, uh, w w uh, next to you, because you're like this. So I'm going to be doing the interview like this, just so I can, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, one or two, maybe if we could, uh, tell a little bit about your background because you've been in the real estate business right for yeah. quite a bit of a long time when, when did you get started what's your background well, um, uh, I'll tell you tell you a little bit about how I got started well I've been in the business since 2002 okay uh, I, uh, I have a Wall Street background I grew up in Brooklyn New York um, what'd you do in Wall Street I was a uh, I was a cold caller and then I became an account opener at a spot trading currency firm. Uh, and it's, it's funny because the, the, the week after, well, the week before, I'm sorry, the week after I became a broker, 9-11 uh, took place. And then the business that I was working with went out of business. Oh, wow. Okay. I lost all of my accounts. Right. With that, the company went bankrupt. Everyone pulled their funds out of, the uh, the company, and then the company just went belly up. Plus, the the headquarters, the main headquarters of the company, was located in the second tower. So, oh wow, um, I basically didn't know what I was going to do at that point because, um, you know, I, I I had worked at that point. I was 19 years old, 20 years old. I had worked a little over a year, kind of building my business up and, and my name, and now it was all gone overnight, literally. So I started looking into real estate as a, uh, a way to, to start making some money. So this is early 2002 is when I, I really Oh, interesting. Started. Okay. And did you jump in full time? I jumped in full time. Okay. Um, initially, I became a real estate agent. Um, I thought that was the best way to go. I got into, uh, I got my broker's license about a, a few months later, mm -hmm. but what I realized is while I was doing real estate, I was selling houses for a lot of investors at that. At that mm. point. And I realized where the real money was. So I started picking my brains and I started uh, uh, putting two and two together. Um, ultimately, I remember selling my first million dollar house in Brooklyn and um, I made $48,000 on it. And that kind of changed the game for you. Mm. The thing was, I made forty-eight grand for the guy who, the investor who owned the house. Right. Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there. So I, I ended up jumping in a, into real estate. I started uh, uh, getting into. I didn't know it was wholesaling at the time. Right. I, I wholesaled my first business. I made fifteen hundred dollars. You know, doing my first uh, real estate wholesale deal around two thousand and three early 2003. So it took me about a year, a little over a year to make some money. Oh, wow. Okay. It took you a while. And then from there, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. Uh, and I didn't have, I didn't know that there were coaches out there. And the only real estate knowledge that I had at that point was a Carlton Sheets course that I bought when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, back then. Yeah. When that's what, that's kind of what you, you and I have the same background because, um, I got started as an agent first mm -hmm. and there was an investor who was buying most of my deals. And so then I went to work for him. Right. But back in the days, I remember 
Um, I bought the Carlton Sheets course on the payment plan, and then I didn't have enough money, so I returned it so they can get my so it was seven bucks, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the first one, but I never really used it. But it's funny because back then there was no like internet or education or nothing like that. You couldn't get it. TV, yeah. man, infomercials. But you know what's so funny? The stuff that I learned in the Carlton Sheets course is circling back around nowadays. Mm. A lot of the stuff. So for, for example, you know, we're going to talk about this later on, but using um, seller financing and lease options and stuff like that, all of that stuff was in that course. I just didn't know how to apply it back then. Right. And, you know, I, I thought back a, a handful of years ago, I said, you know, all of that stuff that I actually read in that course, I'm actually doing. Doing right now, yeah. I'm not even realizing it. So that guy was probably ahead of the game with that. You know, I don't know. I don't know what he's doing these days. <laughs> when was it that you got into the business again? 2002. 2002. Then uh, you, you were able to ride. What happened during the uh, 2008 and nine? So I went, so I was... I, once I got my first deal, things really started rolling for me. Right. Uh, I started doing a lot of deals in New York. Uh, and then I ended up, um, my wife got pregnant. We ended up moving to Pennsylvania. So I figured if I could do it in New York, I could do it anywhere. That's a, the old adage, right? Right, yeah. So I ended up, uh, we moved to Pennsylvania about two hours from the city. So at one point I was traveling back and forth from New York to Pennsylvania. Uh-huh. It really... Uh, building up my relationships in Pennsylvania. And I met a guy who kind of took me under his wing in Pennsylvania. And this is when I really started crushing it and I understood the value of coaching. But um, Steve took me under his wing and he introduced me to some people, my first private money lender. Oh, interesting. Okay. I really just started crushing it in, in uh, Pennsylvania. I started buying, like, once I had access to the funds and once I knew how to turn the contracts over, I started, I mean, I, I bought two, 300 houses in, in Pennsylvania alone. Oh, wow. Okay. I rode that wave up. You know, I was uh, going on 25 years old. I made my first million bucks. And then after that, I ended up uh, uh, around 2008, 2009, I got caught in that, in that win. And I, I literally went bankrupt, man. Mm. Um, I was, uh, because when you're making money like that, you get, you, you're spending, <laughs> You're, you're making, let's say, thirty to 50000 a month, but you're spending fifty two, fifty five, right. because you're like, this money is always going to come. So I was really uh, immature in that respect that I didn't know how to handle the money. You know, I grew up in the projects, man. I didn't grow up in, with any money. So, <laughs> but, um, so long story short, I, you know, I literally had, to, I went bankrupt. But within eight months, I was right back on my feet because I, all I did was take the same knowledge that I already had and I applied it. The only thing is, in 2008, rather than buying a house here, I was buying it here now. And then I created that spread in between. So I just took, took the same knowledge that I had. I just dropped the price. And then I was able to... I was yeah. able to it's funny it. you mentioned that because uh, yeah, I always say that when I started making a whole lot of money, I did the only reasonable thing that... Uh, that you could that you're supposed to do when you make no money and you make a lot of money after you know when you go from making no money to making a lot of money which is buy uh, spend the money like yeah. like like <laughs> like they do at the rap videos right just crazy yeah. i went out and i had a I like an eighteen hundred dollar car payment and that all i was doing was going to ups to, uh, to the ups store at the fedex and they were sitting most of the time in front of my driveway and then yeah. you know what happens is you know when, when you're making a lot of money your expenses go up but then when the money stops, it's hard to wind down those expenses. Like you're trying to, you try to get rid of them. And, and so definitely I could, I could definitely relate because I had a hard time as well mm -hmm. with that. Um, and so then now, so you, you know, obviously you're able to turn around and get back on your feet. It and took you eight months. Eight took months. You eight months. Eight months. That was it. So why, let me ask you this question because uh, why did it take you so short? Because I experienced the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, I think I, it took me long. It definitely took me longer than eight months to, mm -hmm. to kind of recuperate. And I think part of that was, uh, I think it's a combination of changing your strategy, but also mindset, right? Because it's almost like as if like somebody hit you off the side of the head and you're kind of dazed, right? So you kind of get, get your bearings back. What, what do you think made the difference for you to be able to get back so quickly? Well, number one, I had that hustle, man. I wasn't willing to go to sleep until I got back on my feet. So right. I just had some really big checks come in really quickly. And I was able to 
have that six figure income right back with right income. back. Okay. Um, plus just being smart with the money, man, at that point, you know, I wasn't saving anything before that. Yeah. In fact, you, you get smart, you know, you, you wise enough. There's a book called the greatest man, of, uh, the greatest man in Babylon. Excellent book. If you want to really understand what, um, how to manage your money the right way. It's not, it's not a fight. I don't want to call it a financial book. It's more of a story that, I mean, you just can't put down. Right. And you just follow the simple rules uh, in that book. It's, it's phenomenal for changing the financial situation, no matter what your financial situation is. So I was able to implement that book um, in, the, in the, uh, the, the strategies taught in that book. Basically, save 10% of your income, put 10% away, live right. off the home. You know, um, if you follow the strategies in that book, reinvest the 10. You know, this is your, this is your nest egg. Invest your nest egg. Keep growing your nest egg. You know, right. Things like that, it'll absolutely change your life. Because you can make a lot of money. You can, you know, I can make, you know, just these, these past couple of months, I was telling you, we're bringing in like $80,000 and it's only been, I mean, we're still at the beginning of the year right now. Right. We've already closed some of that business, but you know, you can make a lot of money, but it's not how much you make, it's how much you, it really is how much you keep. And I didn't yeah. understand that until I went broke. Yeah, and, and it's, it's funny because uh, the other thing I think about is uh, a lot of times people are always, nowadays, like, you know, one of the things I was thinking about the other day was like when, when people come up and they ask you about your business, right? They always ask you, oh, how many deals you're doing? How much direct mail you're sending out? Like these metrics that don't make a difference, right? Because in the end, people should, the, the question they should be asked is, hey, how much are you netting in your real estate business? And how many hours are you working for that? Because that's, that's the balance, right? Because you could have a business that you could say, well, gee, I'm doing 15 deals a month, but I might only be netting like 15 grand a month. And I'm working like, you know, a ton of hours, right? Um, so it's really, it's really about what you keep. And that's the most important thing, I think, that gets lost many times. It's funny you mention that because I know a guy locally here. He's doing about maybe 40, 50 deals a year. Um, I do, you know, at one point I was doing that. But I'm like, okay, it sucked up too much of my time to do that. Right. I do two to three deals a month where he does five to six. But my average profit is 15, 20 grand. 30 grand on a deal versus his five to 10, I'm making way more money and I'm working on my, I would literally work on my real estate business two hours a day. That's it. Right. You know, yeah. so, you know, and, and we're well into the upper, you know, we're doing very well financially right. in the real estate business. But it's, um, it's that balance of the net and the amount of hours, right? Because uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's something that's lost. And all of the uh, social media and Instagram, because the, you only see the Instagram version of it, but nobody, you know, they, show you, they show you the gross, but never show you the net. I like to see the net, okay? I'm not saying that the guys that show a big gross don't have a nice net, but I like to see that, right? Yeah. Uh, so then now, what, uh, like say, I know that you started the Facebook stuff maybe around October was, I, I was looking through my text messages, yeah. um, and that was, uh, I, that was in, in around October, that's when, uh, when, um, uh, when you first messaged me about that, um, before that, I mean, uh, what, how did that come about? Did you see my stuff on YouTube? I know you and I had gone back and forth. Obviously we go back and forth all the time, but how did that come about? Well, I'm on, you know, I'm in the education space just like you. And right. I'm on your email list. I'm on everybody's email list. Oh, okay. Back in, I want to say September, I decided, okay, um, I'm doing direct mail, you know, we're obviously, doing a lot of deals, I want to start implementing some Facebook stuff because I had played around with it about a year before that. Uh, back in like 2017, I played around with Facebook a little bit. Okay. Um, and when Facebook first, I, I, was, uh, I was learning how to use Facebook. Around September, uh, which is a hand, about a handful of months ago, would you say? Yeah. Um, around September, I started running my own ads and I basically ran a TV commercial that I used. Well, I used to run a TV commercial back in Pennsylvania. Uh huh. Now, I live in North Carolina now, but, and I've been here for four and a half years. But when I was in Pennsylvania, in order to find deals, I was running a TV commercial in addition to my direct mail. 
um, I basically took that 28 second TV commercial and I started running the video. Okay. I didn't know how to set it up. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm willing to take a risk. So I spent a couple grand kind of figuring that out and I got absolutely nothing out of it. Not even one lead. Mm. So then I saw your stuff. You, you sent an email. I can't remember what that email headline said, but it was something about um, Facebook ads. And I, I just can't remember what it said at that time. So I, I remember I had your, your, your cell phone number. I ended up texting you and I said, hey, Chris, you know. Um, What's going on with that? I want to learn how, to, yeah. you know, how, how, how does this thing work? So then, you, you know, um, I went through your program literally within a week or so. By the first week of, I think I contacted you the last week of October. And by the first week of November, I started running the ads. Within the first day, I got like 15 leads. And I was like, this is incredible. Mm. Right? Um, and things didn't, I started playing around with it a little too much. Again, not knowing exactly what I was doing. I just kind of followed exactly what you said. Right. I had to, I realized I had to revamp things. Um, the way that I had it set up was different from the way you had it in the, in the video, in the course. So I ended up readjusting everything, started fresh, got the leads in, started calling the leads. And what I realized is we're getting a bucket of a little bit of everybody. So where I'm, where I'm used to um, maybe sending out a direct mail campaign to a specific type of person, um, the Facebook ads, they, they were bringing in people who were they were not, you had some motivated people, you had a bucket of motivated people and people who were just looking to see what they could get for their home. Right, yes. Part of the game, right? So then I made some adjustments to the ad. So I said, okay, if I can, if I can take what I'm doing with direct mail and take that same type of list and upload it, and you, you talked about it in the course, the lookalike the look -like audience, if I can build that type of audience or a custom audience, and run traffic to that type, that specific type of person. And then if I can adjust what Chris is talking about in these ads here um, and direct them to a specific type of person, uh, let's see how that can, can work out. So I tested, I split tested that up against the original ads. Um, and there's a, a vacant house not too far from uh, where I live at that's been vacant. I've been trying to get this, this house for like four years since I moved here. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, I've been in, I've, I've skipped trace to sell it. The guy died the year that I moved here, but his, his, uh, granddaughter inherited the house and she's just, I mean, nobody lives there. She's just not taking care of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went by that house is, it's run down right now. I took a picture of it and I said, okay, so this is the type of house that I'm looking for. So, Rather than taking a picture of the block, um, the way that you did it, yeah, I took a picture of the house, and then I uploaded the house, and I said, "Do you have a distressed property?" And I kind of went that route with it. Mm -hmm. and that's how I got, um, my first deal done off of that ad campaign, um, and I'll circle back to the ones that you actually provided because um, I just picked up some really killer deals off of that. But off of that that house campaign and running the zip code ads only to a specific type of, it was ba basically a vacant property uh, type of owner. Right. I got this first uh, deal done. And um, the problem was she ended up owing. Okay. So the house was worth about 70 grand and she owed like $55,000 on it. Now most wholesalers or real estate investors in general, especially newer investors with, without the experience, what they'll do is they'll go ahead and they will uh, look at that lead and say, there's no, they'll say, there's no equity in this lead, right? There's not, there's not, there's not enough money in it. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be able to take your leads um, and be able to maximize each and every single lead because there's a deal in everyone that calls you. You just have to know how to put the deal together. So, I mean, rather than doing, wholesale only, you might have a, a rehab opportunity. If there's, if there isn't a rehab opportunity, you might have a, uh, cause I'm a big time rehabber here as well. But, uh, I don't like to say the word big time, <laughs> but, uh, 
I, profitable. It, You're a profitable rehabber. Profitable rehabber. <laughs> if, if, if there isn't um, maybe a rehab opportunity, maybe you'll have a seller finance opportunity or a lease option opportunity or a wraparound mortgage or, you know, and there's so many ors along with that, maybe a subject two. So I initially took on this one as a subject two deal. Um, and her husband had just passed away last June. So she was just ready. She couldn't afford the house, right? She was $5,000 behind on payments. She didn't have the money to catch up on it. So all I did is I said, I'll, I'll buy your house subject to the existing financing, or we can do a lease purchase. Uh, she was comfortable with the subject to the existing financing. Um, all I did was take over her existing payments. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't want anything out of pocket, obviously. I, I, took, I took the property and I marketed it because I own a house literally around the corner from that one. Right. I own a, another owner finance deal that I'm renting. Mm -hmm. So that tenant had a cousin who wanted the same type of deal. Mm. I said, okay, this house needs some work. I'm not going to fix the house up. It needed about $25,000, maybe $30,000 in work. Mm -hmm. I will sell the house to your cousin, rent to own, um, but I want $15,000 down and I want $70,000 for the house. So I sold it for full market value. The, the, the buyer put down $15,000. I took $5,000 from that $15,000 to catch up on the back payments. Got and it. I, and I pocketed the $10,000 on the deal. Um, the buyer, I gave him a six-year plan until he owns the house. So what I'm going to do is collect six. I'm collecting uh, the payments on the house is $417 a month, give and take, $416.56. Uh -huh. The buyer is paying $1,000 a month for six years. And what I'm doing is I'm double, I'm basically take, I'm paying out eight oh five, thirteen dollars every month to the mortgage. So I calculated how much it would cost to pay off the house in 72 months. Eight oh five, thirteen dollars a month, I'm basically taking that out of the $1,000 profit and I'm paying off the mortgage for the buyer, I pocket the extra $195 a month. And, and that's on top of the 10 grand that I, that I made already. And then on top of that, um, at the end, I'll just transfer the deed over to the buyer. You know, that, that's a pretty interesting deal from a couple. So just to make sure I understand. So that's a deal where the mortgage is 50, the house is worth 70, 77. What was the, uh, the, the mortgage was how much? Mortgage was, it was 50, it was, she was $5,000 backed up. Right. Um, so I, right now it's 50 again. Um, okay. The house is worth about 70. So um, a deal like that, it would have been too skinny, right? To buy and to try to wholesale and to try to rehab it. There's not enough money in the deal for rehabbing. Right. Uh, the interesting thing I think is, um, so then you took over the mortgage and now, now so obviously the benefit to the seller was that she needed to get the property off of her hands. Right. She didn't, she didn't have the money to make repairs to be able to sell it on the open market. Right. And then probably investors were coming at her and making her low ball offers. So she had too much of a mortgage, right? She had someone else look at the house, but yeah. he, just he didn't know what to do with the house. Again, that's the benefit of right. knowing how to, how to structure deals. Now with the ten, with the buyer that you got, the benefit to them was they had 15 grand, but did they have their credit wasn't good enough to go out and, and, and buy a deal themselves? His credit was good. Um, I get a lot of, um, uh, I get a lot of Latino, uh, uh, Hispanics mm -hmm. who buy my properties. Um, and they don't usually like to go to the banks, but they usually cashed up. Oh, interesting. Okay. Got it. You know, okay. So, because also there's, there's an issue with they may have good credit, but maybe yeah, he has good credit. He had good credit. He just didn't want to go to the bank for some reason in the back of his mind, going to the bank meant paying the bank for 30 years. Right. Right. Like the, uh, he, he could afford. And it's funny because he's buying the house, but then he decided I'm going to rent this house out. He said, if you could find me one of these every month, I'll buy, I'll buy a house from you right. every month. And he'll, he'll continue to put down 15,000 as long as I can, so, I mean, you're, you're, you're paying down the notes as long as he continues to pay. 
yeah. he doesn't default, then in the end, he's going to own the house free and clear. That's it. Right. So, which is a little bit, it's interesting because I think that the way you structure that deal is you, 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 you structured it. Uh, sometimes on these lease option deals, people structure them with the intent that the buyer isn't really, the buyer is going to end up, you know, canceling or not. And then you're going to get the house back. So really, you know, the intent is for you to maximize the money. It seems like at least from the way that you described the deal that you are making money. But at the same time, you are structuring the deal to give them a, a legitimate opportunity for them to get that house and own the house. Is that, that I mean, that, isn't that what real estate is about? You know, people forget that real estate is about creating win-win situations for everybody involved in a deal. Well, I'm, I'm 100% there because, uh, you know, in the lease option business, many times these deals are structured yeah. with the intent is I'm going to get the house back in two years. I'm going to do that again and again and again. And nobody's ever going to own the house. Because, you know, you don't structure it in a way that gives somebody a chance, right? Um, so I think that I like the way you're doing it because it is a legitimate opportunity for someone, right? It's legitimate. And like, yeah. it's the kind of deal that I would be like, if a relative told me that that's the kind of deal they had, I'd be like, I think that's a good deal. Yeah, I would take that, right? It's a good deal. And on top of that, it's repeat business. You know, again, he mentioned, hey, you know, and this is after the fact. He said, I want to be able to buy more of these right. types of houses for from you. So it's just an opportunity. Look, I'm going to collect $200 a month for six years. That's about 14,500 extra dollars on top of the 10,000. So really right. this $10,000 profit turns into 25 grand. You know? Yeah. So, so, um, on that deal, um, so that was a lease option deal. So the question that I had is just to go back to how you got that deal. So that was, you, you still targeted the zip codes, right? Or the, the zip code targeting. Zip code targeting, but now you modified the ad right. to be more specific to the kind of property that you were looking for. I took the same exact wording that you had in the ad. I just, yeah. I, I tweaked it to focus on a, spe um, a specific type of seller. Okay. And then I now the picture was a picture of the, of the house, of a yeah. house that we need a lot of work. Did you still and have the sign? Yeah, I had the, uh, the sign that you made. Yeah. In, I had the zip code in the sign, the yellow sign. Right. I, let me see if I can find a, a picture of it. I sat it on the side of the house. Got it. Got it. But in other words, you you were representing. So instead of doing the street view, you were representing the exact the type of property with the pole next to it. Right. With the sign on it, with the zip code in it, but except of the street view, it was the picture okay. of the house. It was this abandoned house. Now, did the ad did the ad say you know do you own a vacant property or you kept the ad the same? It was uh, I think it was if I'm let me look at my Facebook ads real quick. Uh, own a distressed property or own a vacant prop something like that. I see. Okay. It was okay. Similar to what, but then what I noticed was I didn't get as many leads with that ad as I did with the ad that you were. Um, that you initially right. Um, but now these the, the, even though you didn't get that many leads, the leads were more qualified. I assume, yes. Yes, they were. But then I would also start getting people saying, "Hey, I'm interested in that house." So I was starting to get some buyer leads as well. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Got so it. it was, so I felt that running the ad that you had was more of a a better way to go uh, to find more leads to be able to sort through these leads. So for, for example, this week, um, just running, I spent since Monday, $285 and 18 cents. Mm -hmm. I received, I received four, 15, eight, 10, about 22, wow. 32, 32, 40, 55, 59 leads already. For 59 leads for 280, Two hundred and eighty-four dollars. Holy cow! That's a lot of that's. that's I, I could tell you how many appointments I got set up now. Right. So for two hundred eighty-four dollars and eighteen cents. And today I went on an appointment yesterday. I think I have a deal with that one. By the way, I was telling you about it. Yeah. Someone just bought a house from me last month, and I made like twenty-one thousand dollars wholesale deal. That same buyer is interested in this house, and I I, I think I'll make another ten grand on this one. So that's just a new deal. I didn't even tell you about yet. And then I got an appointment this afternoon. I got another appointment tomorrow. I got another appointment Saturday and I still got, you know, 15 people to contact. Uh, and while we were on the phone, I just got another one. 
you see that one wow here. that's uh, that's that's a tremendous i mean that's really good cost per lead i mean yeah. now i mean when you're spending eight dollars to ten dollars cost per lead right you know i'll spend that all day long and just keep running it to find some leads you right know, versus i was spending you know close to 50 with the with the house with the house yeah yeah so, you know, it just made more sense for me to just run the ads in the original ads. And I am able to put these deals together because I've gotten some qualified leads out of this batch. Yeah, I think it, it just gives you more opportunities. You'd rather have more leads. That's right. And then and, and, and be able to work with them than to really be narrow because you're, you know, somebody might have, you might show like a really horrible vacant house mm -hmm. and I might see the ad and I'm like, I'm interested but to talk to you, but my, my house isn't that bad. So maybe it's not a good fit. And so then they move on. Um, I do, however, think that it, it you know, the part of the, uh, uh, you know, you may get, like, it, I think it's always good to rotate, you know, and, and you're giving, giving that particular area different looks. So I think it's definitely always, I think you're on the right track with testing. I think that that's the thing that we discussed is yeah. like, you know, now that you, you know, once you understand the framework, the big picture of what we're trying to do, now you can you know now you can add some creativity because like that video that you mentioned the video that you mentioned that you had as a commercial right mm -hmm. so another suggestion you can take that video and in that zip code run it as a video ad right and then say that video and then what you could do is you can create an audience that says hey i want anybody who's watched 50 percent of that video right so they've stopped they looked at the video I want those people to see an ad, to see your regular ad that says, I buy houses. Huh. So then now, you know, so that's, huh? I went the same route with the video ad, but I didn't go the route with the image ad to see it. I didn't go that route. That's actually a really good suggestion. Yeah. So you, 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 you run the video, then the people that have watched say 50%, how long is the video? 30 seconds? 28 seconds. Yeah. So say 50%, 50% video view. Um, People who watch 50% of it that show some interest and then those people you target with those ads, right? Now, the other thing you can do is keep in mind is this, if you're running that video inside of the same zip code that you're running these ads, then people are also seeing you. So they're seeing the video, they're seeing the ad. So it's kind of like, you know, what we do with the info business the in that, huh? All over the place. Yeah, like. It feels like you're everywhere. Like you're everywhere, right? So it's almost like they're seeing you. So by the time you talk to them, I, I think of it this way. This is something to consider is, is that if you, um, the same way with the info business, right? Somebody comes in to the info business where we have, I have the YouTube channel and then I'm, I'm showing them ads. So maybe by the time they get to make a decision about buying the product, then at that point now they, they feel like they know me, right? Yeah, so right. theoretically, the ideal scenario is by the time you go to their house, they feel like they know you. Yeah. Like, you know, because the other part of it, the other suggestion I gave the suggestion to somebody else is that um, you can create a, a, a YouTube channel with just five, seven videos. You're not looking to get national exposure, but all of a sudden now, because people, that's what people do. They look you up and all of a sudden now, like by the time you get to the house, wouldn't it be great if they feel like, man, I watched your video. You had some great tips on this thing and you sat down with them. And now, and then if you get a, even if you get an acquisitions person, because people ask me that, you, they could always say like, hey, Jamel wanted me to give you a call. And like, like I think of it, Grant Cardone, you know who Grant Cardone is, right? Yeah. So, you know, when a salesperson calls me from Grant Cardone's office, they're like, you know, hey, Grant wanted me to call you. You know, Grant, you know, so I still feel like I know Grant and I'm talking to Joe here, but that I still have that connection because I kind of feel like I know Grant, even though I'm not directly talking to him. But that's the same thing with you, because if you had another person, they could feel like, yeah, I, I like, you know, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense, man. That's yeah. actually a really good suggestion. I need to, to really start thinking about how I can incorporate that into uh, running these ads, man. Yeah, because the way I think about it is if you think about a company like, uh, and, and this is a neutral comment I, uh, for, uh, uh, that I'm making about homebesters, right? Mm -hmm. Homebesters have the billboards and have everywhere. So mm -hmm. after a couple of years, now they got market presence because people see them all over the place. But I think personally that uh, with what we, what we just talked about, you can take that same concept, concept that home investors took two years to build. You can condense that. And then 30 days time, people think that you are the go-to guy in that market. Yep. And then when they start seeing your direct mail, cause you, you talked about, right. I thought it was really good on one of your YouTube videos. You, you talked about taking those same leads and then sending direct mail to them, incorporate them into a, file. right. That's how you get the deals. And 
I have to add something to it as well. You know, it didn't, you know, I, I constantly call this, this one deal. It took me maybe five or six calls to actually get her on the phone. Okay. And finally, she called me back. But that's the important part. Most of these people will not answer on the first call. Most of your deals. Uh, so it's important to keep following up, following up, following up, because that's how you get, the, get to the money. Do you text once a lead comes in? Do you call them right away? Do you text them first? What do you? Within an hour. Okay. Uh, which I'm actually working on condensing that because I, I, I have a guy who does my calls for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I started practicing, or well, not practicing, I started uh, taking some of the calls myself to see what the response rate would be versus what he's doing because uh, maybe I'll put them on something else. But um, I call them within an hour or two. Uh, and then if they don't pick up, we leave a message and then I automatically send them an email. Hey, we try to call you because their email address, we have access to it. Through right. The lead form. Uh, and then I just keep, I, I put them in a follow-up sequence. I start, you know, I know in Podio or in the CRM system. Yeah. I know that I have to, you know, I have to keep following up with this person until I get them. Until they do you, do you text them as well? I, I, I've never tried texting them. That's actually a really good idea. Because the other thing to do, the other thing to do is most people won't pick up the phone if they don't recognize a number, right? Oh. So what you can do is send them a quick text that says, hey, hey, like I would say, hey, hey, uh, Jamel, it's Chris. I just got your, uh, um, uh, just got your message. Uh, this is Chris from Chris Buys Houses. I just got your message about the house for sale. When would be a good time for us to chat? Mm -hmm. But now what happens is they see the, they see the text. So now they know who it is. So then now you, you, yeah, then you turn around and you call them regardless within 10 minutes, but now they know who you are. Right. So it gives them like, you're, you're like, like it, to text them first and then, yeah. to try that because now they're, now your number is there. Now they know who it is. Right. Right. So right. I would, I would try that. Good suggestion, man. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, on the lead form, I see that you don't have an asking price on a Facebook lead form. What's, uh, what's the logic behind that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's something to test. The, the, the overall logic is in any form, the more things you ask, yeah. the higher, yeah. the likelihood it is that they're gonna fill it out. Yeah. So I, I ordered them according to the least resistance or the most resistance, right? Meaning that uh, I would assume, my assumption is that somebody's always uh, more, more unwilling to give up their phone number than an email address. Because given the choice, I'd be like, oh, I think he's gonna bother me. I'll give him my email address and I just won't return the email, right? But so I, I have those items in the order that I think is the least. So by the time, you know, the property address is first and the first name, uh, and so by the time they get to the last one, which is a phone number, right, then that, you know, they've already filled out the rest of the form. Right. So um, that, that is something to test. That is something to test. The only thing about that is I think that sometimes the price, um, you know, like uh, sometimes, people tell you a price, but when you get on the phone, you build that rapport. Like yeah. I had a lady the other day where like she dropped 30 grand yeah. in like a two minute conversation. I had, this, I had the same experience last night, man. I was talking with the lady and uh, she said, Hey, I want 70,000 for the house. I said, but she said, but we are putting work into it. So if you could sell it as is, how much would you take? 50,000, 20,000 right. will drop just like that. And the other thing is this, if you're going to ask for the price, sometimes that's a detriment if you have other, if other people calling for you because they're going to cherry pick the leads based on the numbers and really, and really based on, you know, motivation. So for, for right now, that's the only reason I did that is because I wanted to know, okay, what is the least amount of information and the average, uh, yeah, because you want to call everybody and at least the address, you can look it up and if you use some, some sort of research before you get them on the phone. Now I, I heard you say something about the uploaded list and the lookalikes. Uh, did you did you try the lookalikes? Because we've had difficult time with the lookalikes. Is that something that you've tried or tested that had some results with or no? I'm still testing it myself. Right. Um, I'm still playing around with it to figure out how to make it work. Um, but yeah, what what I've done was I've I pulled like five thousand uh, vacant property leads and I uploaded them, but I'm not getting a response that I want. So it has to be a matter of adjusting the message or maybe the image or something like that. I just well, gotta... There's a couple of nuances to that. So the, with the uploaded list, what I found is um, if you had a list that you may have skip traced, uh -huh. that would be, that, and then you had the phone number, that would be an ideal list. 
to be able to, to target, right? Because now you're going to have better matching with Facebook. Uh, the other uh, challenge is that when you're uploading the list, then um, it's hard to get impressions on that list unless you increase the budget more, yes. right? Um, so we're testing at our end with landing pages and different objectives mm -hmm. um, to try and see what we can do. I mean, on, on that uploaded list, on that uploaded list, one of the things that I would try is it depends on how big the list is. How big is that list, the vacant property list? Do you have uh, phone numbers for, for it, by the way, or no? Uh, I want to say about three quarters of that list has phone numbers, but um, it's about 5,000 people. Yeah, 5,000. So, you know, the, the, here's a challenge. If, if, to, if you upload the list, then, you know, um, to get the best matching, you're gonna, it would be best if you had phone numbers. But mm -hmm. if you took that list and you, scra and you scraped and you skip trace that list to get phone numbers just to upload it, mm -hmm. right? Then, um, then it becomes cost prohibitive because then you could have run zip code ads and, and gotten as, you know, more, more leads and, and then, than what you spent already. Right. Um, so, you know, the, so it's the, if I was going to do that, if I was going to skip trace a list, I would script, I would skip trace all the out of state. Because if you think about it, if somebody's in that area, they're going to see your ad. The people that are not really seeing our ad are the people that completely live out of the state. Right. So if I was going to skip trace that list, I would skip trace the out of state people out of the area because you're going to have a hard time targeting them with the Facebook and the way we're doing it. Right. And what you can do to make it easier for you is what you can do is then maybe um, you can test running that video ad on those people. And then whoever does listen to 30 seconds, then you take and you send those people the ads for the zip codes. The zip code ads. Right, right. So to try to peel them off. So that's, that's kind of what I would do. I mean, the, and then the, th the things that I would focus on would be if you're having success with the zip code ads, focusing on those, I like the idea of what are the other looks you can give that. Because if you're running zip code ads, you have different avatars. You have people with vacant properties. You have people with, you know, you know that, that are tired of being a landlord. So I just published, I, I, I think I said, uh, I just published a bunch of new ads and ad copy that you can look at to get ideas and new angles. So I would focus on that. I would do the retargeting of the videos that I just created, right? So now, you know, cause if you have, you know, typically it's 10 to 20%. So let's say you had 20 leads come in, then, then you're gonna have 200 people that clicked on the ad but never submitted the form, right? right? Now some of those people are just curious, but you wanna take those 200 people and now show them, I, I, I follow them around. So those are the people also you'd want to show video ads to as well. And you want to also target them. And whenever you're running those, when you're running the retargeting campaigns, you're not going to spend that much money. Even if you give that retargeting. $5 a day. That's yeah. what I'm, running. I'm running $5 a day on my retargeting ads. Yeah. Right now, so. And even the video ads, what you can do, let's say you do, you're good with video. So you have that commercial and maybe you do like three other videos mm -hmm. and the three other videos are centered around your uh, objections. Hey, why would I sell my house to an investor versus listing with an agent? And you might have a video on that. So like three, so you don't go crazy. Maybe, so you have maybe a total of four videos. So run them on the zip codes that you're running now. Run them at one or $2 a day, no more than that, on video views. See which ones get the most. So you might have four videos and you get two videos that like, men, I'm getting a lot of watch time on these. Maybe, you know, because maybe it's uh, people are finding it interesting, et cetera. And then now you know, number one, is that you got to create more videos like those, right? right. Because maybe right. you did those differently. And then, then, then maybe you could then bump the, those budgets up to maybe $2 or $3. Because what happens is this. What, what, the, way that, the way that we're approaching with the videos and, and, and when you give it uh, just a number, a low number, like $1 or $2, what you're telling Facebook is, um, I gave this analogy yesterday on a Facebook Live that I had, was that you're looking for excess inventory. Meaning that if, if I have a group of people and I, and I really want that ad to show, those people, I'm competing with the weight loss guy, I'm competing with the real estate guy, all those people, you know, like, so if, I, if I'm gonna get Mary, if I'm gonna show my ad to Mary, and I definitely wanna show my ad to, to Mary, then I'm gonna have to pay, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to push those people out. Right. But with the video ads and, and the small budget, what you're telling Facebook is just look, when the, during the day, there's going to come a time when nobody wants Mary. Nobody wants to show an ad to her. Show my ad to her, right? Show my video to her. And then Facebook will put it in there. But I think that, you know, doing the one or $2 a day, figuring out which videos seem to get the most traction, 
you run those. And what you're looking to do is you're looking to simultaneously pick up more audiences that then you could target with those ads. But at the same time, now you're developing that presence in that area so that when they do finally speak to you, they, they might say like, yeah, watch, I've seen your videos. Like you it look like you guys are, because it's funny, there's a guy, Dom, in our group that he said that a lady told him, said to him, look, I called you because everybody sends me postcards, but you're the only one I saw on Facebook. So I thought you were more legitimate. Like they thought that he was more legitimate because they saw him on Facebook and on social wow. media and stuff like that. So to me, that's what I think that the, that, 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 this is where you can take this is where all of a sudden now you're the go-to guy. And also at the same time, I haven't, uh, this is, this is something also that you can do. You could, cause you, I know you, you're experienced with this, but you could also like this whole concept that we're doing could be developed for that area to, of people to bring you deals. Because what, what at the same time, if you were running ads, video ads and, and that sort of thing and building a presence where now people were bringing you deals, right? Legitimate deals that they needed to partner up on. And now you have zero advertising costs. So I think that there's a lot, a lot to do you know, with, with this. You can do uh, like a co-op situation. with. Them. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, um, so I mean it, like in, in the buyer ads, I have one by uh, the buyer ads uh, section. I show you all the, all the interests. I do a video. Where I walk you through all the interests, but you know, you could end up finding deals that way too as well. So, I mean, I think that there's just so many, I think what we're doing now is just scratching the surface. I honestly believe it um, because I think there's just so much more potential. It's exciting to be honest with you. I mean, there's just so much potential and just watching some of the other, um, if you look at like the e-commerce business and, and things like that and the way they run their ads, yeah, just co kind of copycatting off of what they're already doing. Um, those guys have already split tested this stuff. So how do we fit that into the real estate side of things and then make it work in order to be profitable? You know, I hundred percent agree. You know, you know, you're familiar with Dan Kennedy, obviously, right? Yeah. So I always like his saying that he says, if you were a ninja, like, would you want to go fight other ninjas or would you want to just go down to that elementary school and fight the first graders? Mm -hmm. Easier to fight the first graders. Right. Yeah. So when we're like in the national level and you're like, say, if I'm trying to sell a real estate course and I'm average, you know, I'm, I'm competing against other guys that know what they're doing as well for the same attention and et cetera. But in that local level, there ain't much competition. Oh, There's hardly any. Yeah. So to me, that's the exciting thing about this is that when I look at it as from a saturation perspective, it's not that saturated. Right. And, and I think that it's not going to be saturated for a while because there's a, there's, there's a little bit of an obstacle course. Because if you think about it, for you to do direct mail, you can just get the list, get the mail house, and you could do direct mail rather easily. But with this, you know, there's, there's some, there's some, I mean, you had the same, you had the roadblock in the sense that you tried it and it couldn't get it to work. Yeah. Right. You know, to be honest with you, man, this is, I mean, this is a, this is a, a more affordable way to, to start generating leads than direct mail. Um, and you can get, I mean, you can get just a tremendous amount of leads in a short period of time with this. I mean, literally like a, like pushing a button, um, with direct mail, it does. I mean, with both, it takes a little bit of a learning curve. Right. But I mean, that's what you have this program for, you know, yeah. that's why you, you set something up like this so that people can have the answers, but they still, just like with direct mail, they have to understand that you have to go out there and try different things. It, you know, yeah. what works in one person's market may not work in another person's market. So you got to just try different things, but take the concepts, take the, uh, the idea behind what you're talking about in these videos and really make it your own in your yes. life. I agree. Now the, you know, the benefit that you have is also the fact that you know this business, yeah, you know how to talk to sellers, right? Because that, that's the, I think that's the other challenge that people have. And this is completely, it doesn't matter what, what you're doing, whether or not you're doing Facebook or direct mail or cold calling. You're the sellers are not going to make any money. Yeah. Yeah. You got to learn how to talk to sellers. And I think that that's the other thing that people um, completely miss. Yep. And, and it annoys me when so and it annoys me when somebody hasn't even done a deal yet and they're asking me like how can I get a VA from the Philippines to call my <laughs> sellers? And I'm like, you might as well just take your money and get a get a nice lighter and start throwing, you know, start burning it because that's what's gonna happen uh, yeah. as you spend money on leads and you can't close them, right? <laughs> it's, it's priorities, you know, it's just getting yeah. the priorities right, understanding the business, learning the business, not being afraid to take the chances, not being afraid to to get out there and take some type of action. 
Because without that action, you're never going to get anywhere. You're not going to move. Yeah. You really need to, uh, ultimately, you, you got to be able to, you, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. Yeah. Even with the information, even with coaching, you're going to make mistakes. But right. the things are learn from it because that's how you become wiser. The only reason why I, I, I smartened up in real estate is because I made a whole lot of mistakes. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I'm with you. Now, are you doing any, are you, con, you're still, I mean, you told me in December you had a great month uh, from the mailing out the direct mail. Yeah, it was you're still doing the direct mail, right? I, but you're not, it seems like you're doing the direct mail, but you're not going and trying to mail 20 or 30,000 postcards. Like you're no, really being. No, need to. Right. There's no need to in my market. You know, we can do, you know, we can spend 3,000 bucks a month and be fine. You know, but now, but you're focused on, on, and I don't want to say what list you're mailing, but in general, you're focused on, on a more specific list and sellers rather than do, doing blanket mailings, right? Yeah, I don't like blanket mailings per se. I like to focus on specific types of lists. Okay. Um, and, you know, highly motivated seller leads. Let's just right. Say. Okay. Just being laser focused. Laser focused on the leads. And um, I even, you know, like I said, I tested out your blind copy postcards and them things are just like lead magnets, man. I just can't believe it. Yeah. I mean, where I used to get like a 20, 30% response rate off of a yellow letter, I'm getting that with a postcard and spending half the money. And you're calling everybody back though, right? Calling everybody back. Calling everybody back, yeah. I would say, you know, funny, I said now everybody's doing skip tracing now. I think that that was, uh, that postcard was skip tracing 1.0, right? Because in, in the end, it gets you the phone numbers. That's really what it... <laughs> Big time, man. I'll tell you this. Uh, for those of you who are looking for, uh, to, you know, looking to generate leads off of postcards, the object is to find people with multiple problems. Mm. So you might have somebody, just to give you an example, you might have a vacant property when someone is, uh, they live out of town, Maybe they're backed up on the payments. Um, uh, maybe the house needs work. Maybe the, you know, and, you know, you just add all of these problems into one seller's situation. Those are your deals. That's the best type of lead. Yeah. A seller who, who uh, has financial problems with a, with a distressed property that they don't live in. The property isn't, isn't bringing in any money and they got all these compounded problems. That's how, those are the deals. That's those what are the deals. deals, yeah. So if you can find a list, if you can narrow your list to fit that type of person with multiple problems, yes, it's going to narrow your leads down, but really um, it's going to maximize your, your opportunities to find motivated sellers with, um, with the problems that you need in order to be able to fix their problems. Because ultimately we're problem solvers in a real estate business, you know, we right. solve people's problems and we, we create win-win situations. So we're not looking to make all the money on a deal. Kind of like what I did with the lease option situation. Yes. We don't want to make all the money. We want to make sure it's a profitable deal or it's a good deal, a good situation for everybody involved in a deal. And that's how you can go to sleep at night and you can wake up and you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, yeah. you know, I'm contributing to something um, and, you know, I feel good about it. I'm 100% with you. I, I, was, I was just thinking, uh, we might have to continue doing a trade. Um, I'll continue to help you with Facebook and maybe um, um, uh, I need some, a little bit of training on, on the creative side because I'm, I'm the guy that brings the, the hammer, right? But sometimes you don't need the hammer. Sometimes you need a screwdriver, you need a, a, a pair of pliers. And that's what we're talking about here. And not everything uh, fits in, in exactly the right mold. And um, I think that that's... Uh, that's the thing I'm lacking. So that's the thing I'm looking to get better at, uh, at this year as well. Yeah. Just remember there's three ways to make money in real estate. You got wholesaling, you got rehabbing and you have creative investing, right? You can master all three strategies. You're going to be way ahead of everybody else. Who's just, most people are focused on wholesaling only. Right. You know, and that's the problem because like, just to give you an example, you know, just to tell you about that other investor, he, he does, more deals, more wholesale deals, but its profit margins are a lot less. Right. You add creative real estate investing into the mix. I mean, look at this one deal that we're doing off of this Facebook lead. You know, I got a ten thousand dollar check up front, and I'm collecting fourteen grand over six years. Yeah, over, yeah. I mean, that's and then if I decided, you know, on another type of deal, um, 
you know, you can make money upfront, money every month, and money on the back end when you sell the property. Because what you do, I could have sold this house, like I did the, to the one around the corner. I got, I took owner financing on that house. On that particular deal, I bought it for twenty five grand. The seller wanted five thousand dollars down. I sold it as is for forty grand. The buyer put down fifty. Uh, he put down twelve thousand dollars. I took the five thousand out of the twelve. And I gave it to the seller. We closed the deal. It cost me like six thousand dollars. So I pocketed uh, five. I pocketed like sixty, about sixty five hundred dollars on that one. But then I'm collecting a hundred dollars a month on it uh, until the house is paid until for. It paid off, yeah. Remember, my interest rate on that house is zero percent with the seller. Right. The interest rate with the buyer, on the other hand, and his payments are only four hundred and fifty dollars a month. Uh, actually, I'm collecting 150 a month on that one, but the the interest rate for the buyer is like 10. percent So he's gonna, I'm gonna pay off the house a lot quicker than he's going to pay me off. Right. And I'll be able to continue to collect. Then when he balloon payments on that house, when he uh, gives me the balloon payment uh, in two years from now, I'm gonna make another seven thousand dollars. So I had seven uh, about 6,500 dollars up front. Seven thousand on the back end and a hundred dollars a month, hundred and fifty dollars a month for four years. That's a lot of money, man. Yeah, no, it is. It is maximizing. Uh, yeah. Slim deals. Yeah. You know, somebody will say, okay, there's no equity in this house. You know, I'm basically taking that same scenario and maximizing. Maximizing, it. yeah. I got a lead from Facebook yesterday. I went on the appointment yesterday. Most investors will look at this deal and say there's no money in it. Uh huh. Um. I'm going to make $10,000 on it, but I can, you know, I could turn around and turn it into a seller finance deal and make like $40,000 on it. Mm -hmm. so I think I'm going to let it go for the 10 because the investor is interested in it, but it's only a 200,000, about $195,000 home. The seller needs 165 to get out. Mm. So when I'm offering her, she wanted 30,000 to walk away offering her the $30,000, use the investor's money to, uh, to, to uh, pay for my assignment fee of 10 grand and her 30,000. So really the investor is only coming out with $40,000. Right. You take over her payments. Um, uh, I believe her payments is like $800 a month or something like that. Mm -hmm. You take over her payments while we're putting the money. She, the investor puts the money into the house, right? And now the investor doesn't have to go seek new financing. The house only needs 20 grand in work. So the investor is out $60,000. And then when she resells, she'll get all her money back. She doesn't have to take out a loan for $165,000. Right. And we basically see, we get the same outcome without. Yeah. Money on Cause also the, the investor would have had to gotten a hard money loan, pay points. Pay and then at that point, then it wouldn't have been a deal. No deal. Exactly. Right. So Correct. you can utilize what you have yeah. in order to make the deal work. Most investors will walk away from uh, slim profit margins like that. No, I hear you. I mean, that, and that's the thing I, I think that, uh, that I got to get better at. So even for me, like we all have our strength and, that, and, my weak, and weaknesses, and that's one of my weaknesses. Right. Uh, well, before we go, so how much would you say, uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know the answer to this, to this question, is uh, how much have you collected in cash from the stuff you've been running on Facebook thus far? Um, you know, I, I was telling you the other day, I, I, I just got a deal and, um, from that same seller from this one house. Right. Um, and it's been, you know, I was supposed to make $40,000 on oh, that. Oh, I remember. Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember um, you telling me about that. Her son ended up keeping, wanting to keep the house. So she just decided to give him the house. So as of right now, I've probably, I mean, it's been, I've spent, it's been a good, since November, December, January, about three months. Mm -hmm. I collected about $15,000, mm -hmm. uh, $16,000. And I've probably spent, I'll tell you right, uh, it's less than three grand. Okay. Um, which is I not a bad turnaround. So it's about five times the money. Right. Uh, and you got other stuff now in the pipeline. Yeah, so that number. Right. That's what I've collected. And I got right. other stuff um, on the back burner. So uh, with this new business, I got another $10,000 check that should be coming. And then I got some new leads in this week. And some of them look like really good deals. Right. 
I can't really speak on future future. Right, income. right. But at least a cash collected, it's po it's, it's profitable, it's positive, right? Meaning you can make the sixteen and yeah. spend about three, and then you got other stuff that's coming in on the pipe. So it's definitely gonna be that way. So I'm happy. Just to be clear, that three thousand is part of the original two thousand, uh the original money that I spent from se September before I've taken Oh, it. okay. So with me, with the uh so you spent maybe about a grand with me with the stuff. Oh, uh, probably like fifteen hundred dollars total. Oh, fifteen hundred, okay. So if you if you look at that, I a ten X ten X the uh, investment, yeah. And I think I think you're just getting started. I mean, I think you know, know. you know, the That's benefit the that you have Huh? Got them over the holiday season. Yeah, which was probably a mistake. Um, but I turned those ads back on, uh, and I started uh, started rerunning it. But but um, you know, I think it was a mistake to shut them off. Uh, mm. I, I've never stopped my marketing in December, right? The holiday season, but I decided to do that with Facebook. I don't know why, um, but I decided to cut them back on, and it, you know, just the way I left it, and then when I cut them back on. <laughs> They're just generating leads, man. But yeah, I'm about 10x the money right now. Okay. I mean, I think I think you're just starting out. I think as you like all the things that we talked about, as yeah. as you're doing it and you you get you know you're, you're finding your rhythm with it, right? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, Facebook is many times very mechanical, but once you once you get into it, then it becomes instinctive. Like you kind of understand. It's almost like you understand how the machine works, and and so I think it's only going to get better for you. Um, and uh, definitely love to help you with some of the other stuff we talked about in terms of the audiences and, 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 uh, and the videos and everything else because I think that will take it to the next level. But I'm excited. I'm excited and I'm, I'm happy that you reached out to me when we did and, and that I was able to help. So really uh, grateful for that and uh, I love it. And I, I got to learn how to do some creative financing deals. Yeah, call me, man. I'll, I'll be able to, you know, I'll be able to, I'll definitely, I'm the guy, I just, I really started implementing that stuff like 10 right. years ago. You know, just kind of like, saying to myself, okay, I'm throwing away all of these leads. What can I do with these leads? You know, and that's kind of how, and, and most people are afraid to ask. Right. On a financing or are you willing to do a lease option or something like that? You just got to ask for it because most of these people will say yes. You know, how would you like to collect your payments over time? How would you right. like to collect money every month while selling the house? You have to sell it to them a little bit. Yeah. But and sometimes they won't they won't understand it, so you got to be able to explain it in, in in simple terms. But once you're able to do that, and you're able to come up with your own uh, uh, your own swag with it, let's, let's right, say. right, right. That's that's kind of how you that's how you you're able to to get these deals done. It's not hard at all. All you got to do is ask for it. No, Every, no, I agree. The way you ask for um, what's the least amount you're willing to take for your house. You follow up with, are you willing to do owner financing? Are you willing to do a lease option on it? Have you ever heard of rent to own? You know, something like that. And you just kind of roll it into the, that should be part of your conversation. Part of the conversation, yeah. You know? Perfect. Well, I'm definitely going to follow up with you on that. And uh, as always, we're always going back and forth. I appreciate you taking the time. I, I think we went, uh, we went longer than I thought we were. So I, I hope you don't mind. But uh, if- I uh, the gym now, man. That's it. You what? <laughs> I said, I, I'm just, I just have to go hit the gym now. Okay. That's yeah. I got to do that too. I got one in my garage. I'm not using it. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, how, if anybody wants to connect with you, uh, I'll put a description. Uh, I'll put, you give me some links. Uh, I'll put them in the description here, the video. If somebody wants to connect with you personally. Jamel's in the education space too, as well. He does some education, uh, as well and, and teaching others how to do the same thing. Uh, this is not a pitch or promotion. So I get, I don't get paid any money. If you go, if you go to him and, you end up doing something with him. I trust him. Uh, he 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 knows what he's doing, um, and so you know that. So whatever the fact that it's I, I'm providing the link in the description means nothing other than I trust this guy. And if you uh, if you wanted to reach out to him and connect with him, uh, he has my stamp of approval. <laughs> uh, not that he needs not that he needs that any stamp of approval. I'm just saying that. Uh, yeah. But again, really appreciate our time together, guys. Do me a favor, guys. Go ahead and. Uh, Post a comment if you have any questions. If you like the episode, let me know. Post a comment letting me know. And uh, also make sure you hit the subscribe button. And again, I appreciate our time together and look forward to our next case study video.